Chapter 3. The Spacecraft In the eleven brief months which JPL had to produce the Mariner spacecraft system, there was no possibility of designing an entirely new spacecraft. JPL's solution to the problem was derived largely from the laboratory's earlier space exploration vehicles, such as the Vega, the Ranger Lunar series, and the cancelled Mariner A. Wherever possible, components and subsystems designed for these projects were either utilised or redesigned. Where equipment was purchased from industrial contractors, existing hardware was adapted if practicable. Only a minimum of testing could be performed on newly designed equipment and lengthy evaluation of breadboard mock-ups was out of the question. Ready for launch, the spacecraft measured 5 feet in diameter and 9 feet 11 inches in height, with the solar panels and the directional antenna unfolded in the cruise position, Mariner was 16 feet 6 inches wide and 11 feet 11 inches high. The Space Frame The design engineers were forced to work within the framework of the earlier spacecraft technology because of the time restrictions, but Mariner 1 and 2 could weigh only about half as much as the Ranger spacecraft and just over one-third as much as the planned Mariner A. The basic structural unit of Mariner was a hexagonal frame made of magnesium and aluminium, to which was attached an aluminium superstructure, a liquid-propelled rocket engine for mid-course trajectory correction, six rectangular chassis mounted one on each face of the hexagonal structure, a high-gain directional antenna, the sun sensors, the gas jets for control of the spacecraft's attitude. The tubular, truss-like structure extended upward from the base hexagon. It provided support for the solar panels while latched under the shroud during the launch phase, and for the radiometers, the magnimeter, and the non-directional antenna, which was mounted at the top of the structure. The superstructure was designed to be as light as possible, yet be capable of withstanding the predicted load stresses. The six magnesium chassis mounted to the base hexagon housed the following equipment. The electronic circuits for the six scientific experiments, the communication system electronics, the data encoder for processing data before telemetering it to the Earth, and the command electronics, the altitude control, digital computer, and timing sequencer circuits, a power control and battery charger assembly, and the battery assembly. The allotment of weights for Mariner 2 forced rigid limitation on the structural design of the spacecraft. As launched, the weights of the major spacecraft subsystems were as follows. Structure, 77 pounds. Solar panels, 48 pounds. Electronics, 146 pounds. Propulsion, 32 pounds. Battery, 33 pounds. Scientific experiments, 41 pounds. Miscellaneous equipment, 70 pounds, for a gross weight of 447 pounds. The power system. Mariner 2 was self-sufficient in power. It converted energy from sunlight into electrical current through the use of solar panels composed of photoelectric cells, which charged a battery installed in one of the six chassis on the hexagonal base. The control, switching and regulating circuits were housed in another of the chassis cases. The battery operated the spacecraft systems during the period from launch until the solar panels were faced into the sun. In addition, the battery supplied power during the trajectory manoeuvres when the solar panels were temporarily out of sight of the sun. It shared the demand for power when the panels were overloaded. The battery furnished power directly for switching various equipment in flight and for certain other heavy loads of brief duration, such as the detonation of explosive devices for releasing the solar panels. The Mariner battery used sealed silver zinc cells and had a capacity of 1,000 watt-hours. It weighed 33 pounds and was recharged in flight by the solar panels. The solar panels, as originally designed, were 60 inches long by 30 inches wide and contained approximately 9,800 solar cells in a total area of 27 square feet. Each solar cell produced only about 230 one-thousandth of a volt. The entire array was designed to convert the sun's energy to electrical power in the range between 148 and 222 watts. When a later design change required the extension of one panel in order to add more solar cells, 
it was necessary to add a blank extension to the other panel in order to balance the solar pressure on the spacecraft. In order to protect the solar cells from the infrared and ultraviolet radiation of the sun, which would produce heat but no electrical energy, each cell was shielded from these rays by a glass filter, which was nevertheless transparent to the light which the cells converted into power. The power subsystem electronic circuits were housed in another of the hexagon chassis cases. This equipment was designed to receive and switch power either from the solar panels, the battery, or a combination of the two to a booster regulator. CCNS, the brain and the stopwatch. Once the Atlas booster lifted Mariner off the launch pad, the digital central computer and sequencer performed certain computations and provided the basic timing control for the spacecraft subsystems which required a sequenced programming control. The CCNS was designed to initiate the operations of the spacecraft in three distinct sequences or modes. 1. The launch mode, from launch through the crew's configuration. 2. The mid-course propulsion mode, when Mariner readjusted its sights on Venus. And 3. The encounter mode, involving commands for data collection in the immediate vicinity of the planet. The CCNS timed Mariner actions as it travelled more than 180 million miles in pursuit of Venus. A highly accurate electronic clock, crystal-controlled oscillator, scheduled the operations of the spacecraft subsystems. The oscillator frequency of 307.2 kilocycles was reduced to the 2,400 and 400 cycle per second output required for the power subsystem. The control oscillator also timed the issuance of commands by the CC and S in each of the three operating modes of the spacecraft. A one pulse per minute signal was provided for such launch sequence events as the extension of the solar panels, 44 minutes after launch, turning on power for the altitude control subsystem, one hour after launch, and for certain velocity correction commands during the mid-course manoeuvre. A one pulse per second signal was generated as a reference during the roll and pitch manoeuvres in the mid-course trajectory correction phase. One pulse was generated every 3.3 hours in order to initiate the command to orient the directional antenna on the Earth at 167 hours after launch. Finally, one pulse every 16.7 hours was used to readjust the Earth-orientated direction of the antenna throughout the flight. Telecommunications Relaying the Data the telecommunication subsystem enabled Mariner to receive and to decode commands from the Earth, to encode and to transmit information concerning space and Mariner's own functioning, and to provide a means for precise measurement of the spacecraft's velocity and position relative to Earth. The spacecraft accomplished all these functions using only 3 watts of transmitted power up to a maximum range of 53.9 million miles. A data encoder unit with CCS sequencing timed the three phases of the Mariner's journey. One, in launch mode, only engineering data on the spacecraft performance was transmitted. Two, during the cruise mode, information concerning space and Mariner's own functioning was transmitted. And three, while the spacecraft was in the vicinity of Venus, only scientific information concerning the planet was to be transmitted. The CCNS failed to start the third mode automatically, and it was initiated by radio command from the Earth. After the encounter with Venus, Mariner was programmed to switch back to the cruise mode for handling both engineering and science data. This sequence was also commanded by Earth radio. Mariner 2 used a technique for modulating, superimposing intelligent information, its radio carrier with telemetry data, known as phase shift keying. In this system, the coded signals from the telemetry measurements displace another signal of the same frequency, but of a different phase. These displacements in phase are received on the Earth and then translated back into the codes which indicate the voltage, temperature, intensity, or other values measured by the spacecraft telemetry sensors or scientific instruments. A continually repeating code, almost noise-like, both in sound and appearance on an oscilloscope, was used for synchronising the ground receiver decoder with the spacecraft. This decoder then deciphered the data carried on the information channel. This technique was called a two-channel binary-coded pseudo-noise communication system, 
and it was used to modulate a radio signal for transmission, just as in any other radio system. Radio command signals transmitted to Mariner were decoded in a command subassembly, processed, and then routed to the proper using devices. A transponder was used to receive the commands, send back confirmation of receipt to the Earth, and distribute them to the spacecraft subsystems. Mariner 2 used four antennas in its communication system. A cone-like, non-directional omni antenna was mounted at the top of the spacecraft superstructure and was used from injection into the Venus flight trajectory through to the mid-course manoeuvre. The directional antenna could not be used until it had been oriented on the Earth. A dish-type high-gain directional antenna was used at Earth orientation and after the trajectory correction manoeuvre was completed. It could receive radio signals at greater distances than the non-directional antenna. The directional antenna was nested beneath the hexagonal frame of the spacecraft while it was in the nose cone shroud. Following the unfolding of the solar panels, it was swung into operating position, although it was not used until after the spacecraft locked onto the sun. The directional antenna was equipped with flexible coaxial cables and a rotary joint. It could move in two directions. One motion was supplied by rolling the spacecraft around its long axis. In addition, two command antennas, one on either side of one of the solar panels, received radio commands from the Earth for the mid-course manoeuvre and other functions. Attitude Control – Balancing in Space Mariner 2 had to maintain a delicate balance in its flight position during the trip to Venus, like a tight wire walker balancing with a pole, in order to keep its solar panels locked onto the sun and the directional antenna pointed at the Earth. Otherwise, both power and communications would have been lost. A system of gas jets and valves was used periodically to adjust the attitude or position of the spacecraft. Expulsion of nitrogen gas supplied the force for these adjustments during the cruise mode. While the spacecraft was subjected to the heavier disturbances caused by the rocket engine during the mid-course manoeuvre, the gas jets could not provide enough power to control the attitude of the spacecraft, and it was necessary to use deflecting vanes as rudders in the rocket engine exhaust stream for stabilising purposes. The attitude control system was activated by CC and S command 60 minutes after launching. It operated first to align the long axis of the spacecraft with the sun, thus its solar panels would face the sun. Either the sun sensors or the three gyroscopes mounted in the pitch, rocking back and forth, your side-to-side -side and roll axes, could activate the gas jet valves during the manoeuvre, which normally required about 30 minutes to complete. The spacecraft was allowed a pointing error of about one degree in order to conserve gas. The system kept the spacecraft swinging through this one degree of arc approximately once each 60 minutes. As it neared the limit on either side, the jets fired for approximately one fiftieth of a second to start the swing slowly in the other direction. Thus, Mariner rocked leisurely back and forth throughout its four-month trip. Sensitive photomultiplier tubes, or electric eyes in the Earth sensor, mounted on the directional antenna, activated the gas jets to roll the spacecraft about the already fixed long axis in order to face the antenna towards the Earth. When the Earth was acquired, the antenna would then necessarily be orientated in the proper direction. If telemetry revealed that Mariner had accidentally fixed on the Moon, override radio commands from the Earth could restart the orientation sequence. Propulsion System The Mariner propulsion system for mid-course trajectory correction employed a rocket engine that weighed 37 pounds with fuel and a nitrogen pressure system and developed 50 pounds of thrust for a maximum of 57 seconds. The system was suspended within the central portion of the basic hexagonal structure of the spacecraft. This retro rocket engine used a type of liquid propellant known as anhydrous hydrazine, and it was so delicately controlled that it could burn for as little as two tenths of a second and increase the velocity of the spacecraft from as little as seven tenths of a foot per second to as much as 200 feet per second. The hydrazine fuel was stored in a rubber bladder inside a doorknob-shaped container. At the ignition command, nitrogen gas under 3,000 pounds per square inch pressure 
was forced into the propellant tank through explosively activated valves. The nitrogen then squeezed the rubber bladder, forcing the hydrazine into the combustion chamber. Hydrazine, a monopropellant, requires a starting ignition for proper combustion. In the mariner system, nitrogen tetroxide, starting or kindling fluid, was injected into the propellant tank by a pressurised cartridge. Aluminium oxide pellets in the tank acted as catalysts to control the speed of combustion of the hydrazine. The burning of the hydrazine was stopped when the flow of nitrogen gas was halted, also by explosively activated valves. Temperature control Mariner's 129 days in space presented some unique problems in temperature control. Engineers were faced with the necessity of achieving some form of thermal balance so that Mariner would become neither too hot nor too cold in the hostile environment of space. The spacecraft's temperature control system was made as thermally self-sufficient as possible. Paint patterns, aluminium sheet, thin gold plating and polished aluminium surfaces reflected and absorbed the proper amount of heat necessary to keep the spacecraft and its subsystems at the proper operating temperatures. Thermal shields were used to protect the basic hexagon components. The upper shield, constructed of aluminized plastic on a fiberglass panel, protected the top of the basic structure and was designed for maximum immunity to ultraviolet radiation. The lower shield was installed below the hexagon. It was made of aluminium plastic faced with aluminium foil, where it was exposed to the blast of the mid-course rocket engine exhaust. The six electronic cases on the hexagon structure were variously treated, depending upon the power of the components contained in each. Those of high power were coated with a good radiating surface of white paint. Assemblies of low power were provided with polished aluminium shields to minimise the heat loss. The case housing the attitude control and CC and S electronic circuits was particularly sensitive because of the critical units that might fail above 130 degrees F. A special assembly was mounted on the face of this case. It consisted of eight movable polished aluminium louvers, each activated by a coiled, temperature-sensitive bimetallic element. When the temperature rose, the elements acted as springs and opened the louvers. A drop in temperature would close them. Structures and bracket assemblies external to the basic hexagon were gold-plated if made of magnesium or polished if aluminium. Thus protected, these items became poor thermal radiators, as well as poor solar absorbers, making them relatively immune to solar radiation. External cabling was wrapped in aluminised plastic to produce a similar effect. The solar panels were painted on the shaded side for maximum radiation control properties. Other items were designed so that the internal surfaces were as efficient radiators as possible, thus conserving the spacecraft's heat balance. The Scientific Instruments Four instruments were operated throughout the cruise and encounter modes of Mariner. A magnometer, a solar plasma detector, a cosmic dust detector, and a combined charged particle detector and radiation counter. Two radiometers were used only in the immediate vicinity of Venus. These instruments are described in detail in Chapter 8.